अंतर्यश बहिर्दू दतिमिम ज्योतिर्मयम शाश्वतम स्थान प्राप्य विराजते विनमता अज्ञान मुन्मूल पश्यन विश्व पीत मुलसती यो विश्व पारे पर तस्म श्रीरमणाय लोकगुर शोक से हंत्रे नम तुपरी विल्ला इपिर पेन पयन उपिड वायेन अरुणाचल ओम नमो भगवते श्री रमणाय वेरी ग्रीटिंग्स टू द सिस्टर्स ब्रदर्स एंड चिल्ड्रन इन श्री भगवान विशिंग यू ऑल वेरी हैप्पी सेवेंटी थर्ड आराधना ऑफ श्री भगवान this is an august gathering of mature devotees i mean brings tears to my ear eyes to see the ever increasing maturity in each one of you every time i happen to be turn around and come back at very short notice and uh, as dc was home for us for 28 years but i promise you i'll slow down the frequency of visits because a uh, lot of things are going on a lot of exciting things are going on in the ashram and starting with the centenary of the ashram the theme of the centenary is R- shri ramana ashram the first 100 years the next 100 years and forever and that team was beautifully beautifully brought out even better uh, than what we could say by uma and ps what a moving song and uh, uh, really hats off to them really really moving composition and when we have such devotees you know for an organization is nothing is only as strong as the sum of its parts when we have such an august group of people gathered and following the master's teachings you know even with even more clarity than when he was in the body what what my job as a president is very easy i really just an honor and uh, uh, a privilege and my path to moksha is by serving you all and getting a little bit of your punya friends on the aradhana was celebrated in the ashram last week with a traditional pomp there was nadaswaram to wake everybody in the neighborhood out of their slumber at 4:45 in the morning beautifully done and then we had a robust chanting of tamil parayana which uh, some of you must have seen through the live telecast and uh, afterwards uh, we after breakfast we had elaborate puja at the shrine for with uh, live singing from 7:45 to 10:45 and uh, again uh, several thousand of thousands of people were uh, fed a festive uh, meal uh, lunch uh, breakfast lunch and dinner i i would uh, take this opportunity to refresh our thinking why friends are we gathered here to celebrate aradhana and why are we having a satsang and what exactly is a satsang and uh, because periodically uh, uh questioning why we do such things would take the monotony out of the exercise and bring about the magic that we bring about during such occasions literally aradhana in tamil means worship in hindu 
religious parlance. It denotes the yearly worship offered to a saint on the day of their shedding the mortal coil. What does Aradhana mean? Is it enough to just pay our respects to our Guru, worship him on that day, crave for his blessings? Is this the only significance? Is the Aradhana limited to only one single day? Is the celebration of Aradhana mean different meaning for us, Sri Bhagavan's devotees, as compared to other groups? For we are all in various degrees of annihilation of body consciousness, ego related problems. First of all, let us evaluate what birth or death mean to a jnani. Sri Bhagavan always challenges us by asking us, who is born? It is only he who asks, whence am I born? That is truly who is born in Brahman, the prime source. He indeed is born eternally. He is the Lord of Saints. He is the ever new. This is from Ulladu Narpadu Anubandam, verse 11. It therefore follows that the true birth is our spiritual birth, our journey towards the Atman, the eternal being. The birth of the body is not our true birth. Extending the logic, we come to the conclusion that the death of the body cannot also be construed as true death. The death experience of Sri Bhagavan resulted in the death of I am the body idea. The limited self died and therein was born the true self, the supreme sage. On that warm day in Madurai, the death of the 16-year-old Venkatraman resulted in the permanent birth of Sri Ramana Maharshi, the sage, the savior of the sincere seekers of truth. This is well put by Acharya Vinoba Bhave, a Gandhian, who was a devotee of Bhagavan. He paid one of the most fitting tributes to Bhagavan on the occasion of his Maha Nirvana. Quote, Sri Ramana Maharshi did not give up his body now. He gave up his body when he was 16 years old. Vinoba Bhave put the incident in proper perspective, emphasizing the truth that Sri Bhagwan's present transcended his physical frame. His physical death was just the disappearance of his body. The Supreme Self remains untouched, as powerful as ever. This is why Bhagwan counseled his grieving devotees, testifying to his timeless presence when he said, where can I go? I'm always here. So why are we observing his aradhana with pujas and feasting? Is it just a yearly ritual to be forgotten the next day, to be remembered the same time next year? If it were limited to just performing pujas, singing his hymns on that particular day, then very little purpose is served. It will then remain a mere ritual. But if we understand the true significance of Bhagavan's Maha Nirvana, then the yearly observance of Aradhana will be of great significance to all of us. We have seen that true birth is the birth of knowledge, the Atma Vidya, the establishing of true being, the spiritual heart 
the hridayam which is only born upon the death of i am the body idea birth and death friends are not really different but are only two sides of the same coin as i said the boy venkatraman had to die on that day 16 to be born as the supreme sage shri ramana maharshi the real question is therefore are we prepared to give up our ego let it die so that our true i will take birth and it is not as if the true i did not exist before it always exist rather it is it is the only truth but we who are occupied with our little selves are hardly aware of its presence it is only upon the death of the ego the giving up of the i am the body idea that we become truly and fully aware of it the aradhana of the sadguru who guides us through this death and birth is therefore important and can be an instrument of inner transformation in each one of us if if only on this day we renew our pledge to pursue the truth our guru's teachings with a dedicated passion on this day when we are celebrating bhagwan's aradhana let us resolve to rededicate ourselves to die to our ego and be born anew in the eternal self may we all march on to atma sachatkara for observance of bhagwan's aradhana will then be truly re- relevant and most useful coming to the second uh, question today uh, why are we doing a satsang and what is a satsang friends uh, when i went back to the ashram and uh, everybody asked me what do you want what do you want to do new and uh, think uh, the, the one simple word is i want to be known as a satsang president and i'm glad to report to you that uh we have new satsang centers happening every year you know every month somebody writes to me and uh and uh, i encourage them to uh get gather and not be worried and always tell them the story of dc how we started with three or four families and and uh, i think vaskar would testify we at least we have uh, several hundred uh people interested in the function and again numbers don't matter but but then what matters is the intensity of the devotees and how we benefit from the gatherings how closer we get to bhagwan's uh, truth by these gatherings and the uh so the why i would like to say is what is a satsang what does it do to me on this spiritual path is a valid question each one of you can ask in a traditional meaning it means holy company association with the good and wise our bhagwan refined this term this eight to one spiritual practice satsang der- derives its meaning based on the etymological meaning of the term upanishad that is to sit close by or near to a realized holy man so there are those teachings given by sages to their disciples who are sitting steadfastly near their teachers and they were able to grasp the meaning of the teachings and those utterings were called upanishads the implication was that in order to receive the wisdom one had to be in the direct presence of the sage and receive his or her blessings experientially 
However, some Advaitans interpreted the term Upanishad to mean steadfastly sitting close to the inner self. In other words, this wisdom simultaneously applied to both an internal and external relationship with the Guru. Bhagavan used both meanings of the term for the term satsang, but he gave priority and preference to the latter meaning. For, after all, what is a sage? A sage is certainly not his or her body. She is an embodiment of the self. Of course, being in the presence of a realized sage is remarkable as one is in the presence of the external manifestation of the self with incredible as benefits from such an association. Quote, everyone is apt to be confused from time to time. This is Bhagavan's quote. Although the truth is heard and understood, at times it is forgotten and mistakes are committed when facts face the person. Knowledge gives place to ignorance and confusion is a result. But the sage alone can give the right turn to our thoughts from time to time. That is the necessity for satsanga, association with wise, from talk 609. Bhagavan said that the real being is a self, and therefore no physical form is needed for satsang. He often spoke of the immense benefit of a jnani, the flow of power from the Guru can be received by anyone whose attention is focused on the self. Distance, distance is no impediment to its efficacy. This attention is often called satsanga, which literally means association with the being. Ramana said that this was the most efficient way of bringing about a direct experience of the self. Bhagavan gave a much wider definition. He said that the most element in satsanga was the mental connection with the guru. Satsanga takes place not only in his presence, but whenever and wherever one thinks of him. The supreme value of satsang is further confirmed with the following five verses of the glory of satsang from Ulladhanath Pada Anubandham. Quote one. By satsang, the association with the objects of the world will be removed. When that worldly association is removed, the attachment or tendencies of the mind will be destroyed. Those who are devoid of mental attachment will become one with that which is motionless. Thus, they attain liberation, cherish their association. The next verse, the supreme state which is praised and which is attained here in this life, in this life by clear inquiry, which arises in the spiritual heart, when association with a realized person is gained, is impossible to attain to listening to preachers by studying and learning the meaning of scriptures by virtuous deeds or by any other means. Three. Verse three. If one gains associations with sages, of what use are all religious observances when the excellent cool southern breeze is flowing what is the use of holding on to a fan four heat will be removed by the cool moon poverty by the celestial wish fulfilling tree and sin by the ganges but know that all these beginning with heat will be removed merely by having the blessed darshan of incomparable sages. Fifth verse, the last one. Sacred bathing places, which are 
composed of water and images of deities, which are made of stone and earth, cannot be comparable to those great souls. Ah, what a wonder. The bathing places and the deities bestow purity to mind after countless days, whereas such purity is instantly, is instantly bestowed upon people as soon as sages see them with their eyes. I'll quote uh, from talks again. Quote, for many of us who did not have chance to be in his physical presence, he remarked, I'm going to quote now. Bhagavan says, do you mean the physical proximity of the sage is helpful? What is the good of it? The mind alone matters. The mind is what that must be talk, contracted. Talk 171. What satsang does is to make the mind sink into the heart, the spiritual resting place of the Atman. Association with the sage is both physical and mental. The extremely visible being of the sage pushes the mind inward and the sage, the sage is also the heart of the seeker. And so he draws the latter inward Inward bent mind into the heart. Talk 223. Now, friends, I'd like to uh, conclude by giving you updates on the uh, centenary celebrations. As I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the ashram has uh, uh, on a path to uh, encourage satsang centers because uh, being living in the U.S. for 28 years, I see the value of this uh, association with the wise, where each of us watch out for one another and we go on this path, march on towards moksha under the watchful eyes of our master, helping each other. The, uh, we are in the uh, almost completion stages of uh, new rooms in the ashram. So I hope uh, next time when you uh, visit, we will uh, we have a chance to uh, enjoy the, the rooms so that uh, we're getting tired of saying no rooms, no, no rooms. So even though we don't want to become, you know, filter room namely with uh, rooms, but we, our devotees need uh, a place where they need not worry about the day-to-day -day things and just can spend their three to five days or 10 days just in the ashram drinking the spiritual nectar. The, um, there's more greening effect uh, all around the ashram. The, 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 ashram, the ashram will work with the collector who is our, one of our government trustees who has uh, offered us complete support in uh, uh, reviving the various ponds. Historically, there used to be 108 ponds all over the Girivalam path. Now we can probably see eight or 10 of them. And there are beautiful aqueducts built by uh, a, a king with wisdom so that every drop of rain which fell on the holy hill was captured through that aqueduct into the 108 uh, uh, ponds all over. So, so we have that, uh, we are uh, trying to deweed all those and so that the water can uh, flow down and at least uh, revive, starting with uh, a few wells, uh, two um, uh, ponds near the ashram. And that results in a tremendous increase in the groundwater all over the ashram. We, the town. Um, I'm sure you'd have noticed uh, much more trees or, and uh, plants and flowers all over the ocean. So we like to continue that in a very ecologically sensitive way. We don't want to consume groundwater to drinking water to water plants. The uh, 
we, we want to uh, make this uh, centenary celebration uh, use uh, the devotees' uh, money well. Uh, we'll have uh, gatherings like that, but we will not uh, have too many of those. Uh, we would use um, the uh, this, this opportunity to revive in old books written on Bhagawan in various world languages. And already uh, several uh, uh, books are coming up in European languages and in Indian languages. The goal is to have the 10 co uh, core books of Bhagawan in each wo world and Indian language. And as you know, at the lowest cost possible, the ashram is committed that we will not make any profit out of these books. So that we will try to, and I promise you, no book will ever go out of print after this uh, intervention. The digital uh, uh, process of the ashram is going on well. I hope uh, you're all taking uh, advantage of the daily Veda Parana in the evening and the pujas. We'll try to uh, live cast every important function of the ashram. And uh, so the, the, the final uh, uh, objective of the centenary is to get in uh, a deeper association with the devotees and the ashram. We want to make this uh, a responsive place where we are in constant communication with uh, the devotees and you are our strength. And I want to uh, sincerely mean that. And any uh, good suggestion and uh, going along with the times, we will maintain the ancient tradition and purity, but the a tinker on the side to make sure that you all have a, uh, a good experience whenever you visit the ashram. And uh, with uh, these words, I, I will uh, move on to the next uh, item in the function. Thank you so much for your attention. Om Namo Bhagavate Shri Ramanaya. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Mom.